Let's analyze an example of having six questions on the exam, out of which you should answer three. Bear in mind that you may have a coursework instead of an exam. If it's a coursework, then different preparation is required. Um, and you are highly recommended to book a tutoring session with us if you're not sure about how to create your study plan. We can help you create a correct study plan that should be followed for you to maximize your chances of getting your first class. So, uh, if it's a if it's a, if it's an exam or even if it's a coursework, these are the the topic that most probably will come up on your exam. Copyright, trademark, and patent. These are the three the most important intellectual property topics. And it's very very important that you are prepared to answer both problem and essay question style uh, essay question style uh, on these topics from our website as well as your past exam papers. So if you go to our, our website, you will go to intellectual property law and you will see model essays. Um, in the model essays, you can just have a look at the questions and, uh, and draft the answers uh, and then compare the, your answers to our answers. And that is a really, really good way for you to practice and make sure you improve your legal writing skills. The other way of doing this is, well, actually additional way because you're recommended to do both of them. Uh, additional way um, that you should um, you should do is uh, you should improve your legal skills uh, is to if you have a look at past exam papers and at the past exam papers you will see what kind of questions students got in your university uh, last year the year before and so on uh, and if you're prepared to answer last year's exam very well um, it, you should be prepared to answer the, your exam as well uh, so it's very important that you practice with those. The university should provide to you um, the past exam papers, but if you can't find it, um, you can email your professor and ask them directly to just um, send you the past exam papers, but it should be on, on the on model. Generally, it is very important that you understand the general structure of how you should answer problem and essay questions. If you understand this structure and you have this structure very well thought out, uh, it's very, very easy to then apply these legal writing skills to all of the questions you get. So if you are very uh, skilled in writing problem questions, even if you don't know anything about the topic, you will be able to answer it properly because legal writing skills, once you learn it, it is applicable to all the study modules. Firstly, what you need to do in a problem question is identify all the legal issues that arises in the problem question. IRAP structure. Most of the students know they have to follow the IRAP structure, but, but they, they ignore its, its importance or they're not sure how important it is, or they just do it with the first legal issue and then with the, the, the rest of the legal issues, they just they, they, they just randomly write things. It's, it's very important that your structure is very, very clear. What does this mean? Just put it very clearly on in your answer. Where is the legal issue? What is the legal issue then? What is the applicable law? What is the application of the applicable law to the facts of the case? And then conclude. Then you start second legal issue, then third legal issue. So every single legal issue that arises in the problem question has to be following this structure. The paragraphs have to be divided so that the examiner knows exactly where is the statement of the issue, where is the rule, where is the application analysis, and where is the conclusion. So the examiner has absolutely no doubt as to where to find things and where are your arguments. Make sure that you have very, very, very clear structure. Most of the professors will deduct a lot of marks if your structure is unclear. Uh, firstly, let's have a look about copyright and what are the main principles about it. Copyright is an unreg unregistered um, system and one does not need to apply for a copyright. They gain the rights for the life of the author plus 70 years. So unlikely to patent and uh, trademark, well, trademark different rules applies, but at least patent, which has to be applied for, it has to be registered, it's different. In this case, uh, copyright automatically applies. Um, and the relevant law, section one of the Copyright Design and Patent Act 1988. Copyright is found in original literary, dramatic, musical, artistic works, sound recording, films, or broadcast, typographical arrangements of published editions. So in the UK, 
copyright is a closed system. What does this mean? It means that only some uh, recognized areas of um, intellectual property will attract corporate protection. Uh, unlikely, uh, unlike to the other systems like European system where the uh, scope of protection could be wider. So make sure that the first thing you do in a corporate problem question or an essay question, you explain that the intellectual property you're concerned with in the problem question actually fits in the criteria of copyright protection under section one. Is it original, um, is it a literary, dramatic, musical or artistic work? It could, if it's musical, say it's musical, so it, it, it falls under section one of the copyright CDPA. Um, so make sure that you, you mention that it actually falls under the recognized categories. Uh, you can read our notes on copyright at this link. It's very important that you read them after the session uh, to know what are the main principles about copyright in more details. Openly systems such as in France, from French legislation article uh, L1121 of the Intellectual Property Code, copyright is granted to the rights of the authors in all works of the mind, whatever the kind, form of expression, merit or purpose. So as you can see, the, the protection uh, is a lot wider than in the UK. They have no strict definition of what can and cannot be protected, unlikely, uh, unlike to close uh, least system that the UK adopts. Yeah. UK only grants copyright on works that fit into specific categories. Uh, these are found as definitions in statutes, such as how Section 3 of CPDA uh, defines what should be considered literary, dramatic and musical work. Uh, or how Section 5A defines the exact principles needed to consider something like a sound recording. So it's a lot more limited than an open list system. And make sure the first thing, the first legal issue you deal with um, is, is that the, the intellectual property you're concerned with and the problem question actually fits in the criteria that the UK puts for uh, intellectual property to attract copyright protection. So main issues in copyright are the following. Firstly, originality requirement. The copyright needs to be original. It's not, uh, so if you uh, copy and paste somebody else's work, you, your work will not be protected by, uh, by copyright. It has to be original. And what uh, it can be tricky as to what is original. So there are lots of um, cases on this area. Uh, that you should be reading. We have case summaries are published on our website. It's highly recommend if you go to our intellectual property law um, a page on the simple study and have a look at our case summaries. Uh, and since originality requirements is quite tricky, and it's very often asked on, on the IP law exams. Um, you should know the, the cases and what cases um, the court considered there was original requirement in what case the court considered there was not enough originality for, for the work to track copyright protection. So in, in the obvious, uh, obvious answer is um, the, the work that has been entirely written by the author and it's original, it's not copied from somewhere else that should not have any issue with attracting copyright protection under, under the Act. Uh, second issue, moral and economic rights that, you get, can, uh, that the corporate protection has. Now, copyright infringement and exceptions, these are the topics that you need to know. So uh, what are the consequences for infringing the copyright? And what are the exceptions in which case copyright can be infringed? Uh, for example, the exceptions are uh, quotation defense. There are defenses you can, uh, you can have a look uh, Yes, and um, most probably these defenses will be applicable to your exam. So make sure that you have a look at all the defenses. One of the examples I said uh, before was quotation. So you can actually copy somebody else's work as long as it's not, uh, it's not like a big paragraph, it's just a little bit, like maybe a sentence or two. It might, it's, there is no specific limit as to how much you copy, but if you quote it and if you, you know, if you say that this is from some specific source and you reference it correctly it can be copied and it does not destroy copyright protection 
but um, there are a lot of limitations as to in what case um, the quotation defense applies and you should be able to understand it very carefully. Second very important topic in RP law that you should be aware of is trademark. There are two main areas of law that the courts use for trademark law. The first is the, the Act itself, 1994 Trademark Act, and uh, the, which is the UK domestic law. We also have a trademark directive 2016, um, which is the relevant EU law. So the first thing you need to know is in what case uh, will uh, the trademark protection be granted. Uh, the Act, uh, this is Article 4 of the Directive, uh, sets out the absolute grounds for refusal or invalidity of a patent. A sign that cannot constitute a trademark is defined as needing to be capable of distinguishing the goods or services of one undertaking from those or other undertakings being represented on the register in a manner which enables the competent authorities and the public to determine the clear and precise subject matter of the protection afforded to its proprietor. If these two requirements cannot be met, a trademark will fail as invalid under Article 41A. So these are the, uh, the grounds in which absolute, um, the, the trademark protection will be, um, uh, will be refused. This is an example problem question that we will have a look at trademark. As Samuel sells wine, he's thinking of registering a new trademark consisting of a bottle in the shape of a bunch of grapes. Samuel has never used this shape um, of, for any of its wine bottles before. Before reading the answer, good practice would be if you try to answer it yourself and then prepare your answer to our model answer. The first issue, subject matter of the trademark, is a new shape of a bottle, the shape of a bunch of grapes. The test of registrability must be applied. Applicable law is section one, one of the trademark Act, 1994. Three requirements should be satisfied. Sign, the case of Dyson, is a good case to cite. When we're talking about what kind of signs can be recognized for trademark. Secondly, capable of distinguishing. So the, the trademark itself has to be capable of distinguishing the business from others. And third requirement, capable of being represented graphically. Just um, we will discuss this requirement later in more detail. So element one, in the application part, you have to apply each one of these requirements separately and make arguments whether or not these elements are met in your problem question. And if they are, why? If they are not, why? And cite relevant statutes and cases. Element one should be satisfied because the shape of the bottle to be registered as a trademark can be apprehended by the specific shape that the bottle has. Hence, it is assigned for the purposes of the Act, section 11B of Trademark Act 1994. Element two should also be satisfied because a bottle in the shape of grapes can be distinguished from other bottles. Samuel has never used the shape of any of his wine bottles before. Element three, capable of distinguishing, could be satisfied by arguing that an average wine consumer should be able to distinguish the sign bottle in the shape of the grape and determine the brand because they have not used this kind of shape before. Requirements under section 11, Trademark Act is most likely satisfied. Uh, so as you can see, we have applied uh, the relevant law for all the three elements, and we have said that mm, uh, after, just, after applying the law, we could conclude that uh, the requirements are satisfied. The second issue, if any of the absolute grounds for refusal of registration under Section 3 applies, Section 3 of the Trademark Act, uh, it is an absolute ground for refusal if the mark is devoid of distinctive character. Here, the bottle in the shape of grape can be argued to have a specific shape mark that is distinguishable from other bottles. It is not common to see a bottle in the shape of grapes. On the other hand, it can be stated that it's a bottle that is part of the product that has nothing unique 
Hence, it could be devoid of distinctive character and trademarks should be refused if the court takes this view. So we, as you can see, we saw we saw that there are two, two ways the court can look at this matter. Firstly, the court may say it's just a bottle, it's, it's nothing, nothing special about it. But the other way of looking at about this problem is um, saying that, well, this, this is a shape of a grape, this is something special, it's not just the bottle. So you can never say this is the correct answer because that's not how law works. There are different ways of looking at the matter and the court will, you never know what the court will actually say. So your job here is to just have, a, to, to, to tell the examiner what are the mm, possible ways the court may um, analyze this matter and what are the possible interpretations that the court may adopt uh, in this specific case and make sure that you use the relevant case law when you make your arguments. Uh, the idea of a trademark must be clear and precise. In the case of Dyson, a uh, new backless vacuum cleaner was not argued to be clear because it was not uh, it was extremely non-specific. It would give uh, Dyson a massive competitive advantage to prevent competitors from making any sort of vacuum cleaner with a clear collecting bin. Applying this principle, it can be said that if Samuel can trademark a bottle with the shape of a grape, other companies selling a product in a bottle would be prevented to do so if a bottle is trademarked. Finally, a bottle shaped as a grape is part of the product because they produce wine and trademark cannot be part of the product. It must be signed a company goods on the product. So as, we, as you can see, we have um, we have discussed in more detail is the applicable law, applicable cases. And if we apply the, um, the analysis that court adopted in the case of Dyson, we could say that if, if we trademark bottle, then other people who produce uh, products, uh, to, so who sell the products in a bottle can also be found to be in breach of the trademark because it's it, there is, like the, there are lots of businesses who uh, sell beverages in a bottle and this could be a problem. Like if like it was for Dyson, you cannot like uh, trademark uh, a, a general product, like they wanted to basically trademark vacuum cleaners. Uh, and um, the same principle can apply to bottles uh, and also um, at the, the grape, the, the wine they sell as part of the product and it, it has to be not part of the contract or the conduct part of the product but it must be a sign a company puts on the product uh, which may not be the case here so it, it can be concluded that bottle shaped as a grape will more likely not be able to register as a trademark because it is a part of the product wine that the company produces and on a specific sign non-related to the product can be trademarked. Conclusion, acquired distinctiveness test can save the trademark if it has acquired distinctiveness through use. However, in this case, the distinctiveness shape of grapes is purely decorative, which does not qualify as acquired distinctiveness of the trademark in the eyes of the consumer. So this is the most likely and more likely interpretation that the court may take in this case, but this is far from being a definite answer, and this is how you should be able, you should answer your, your problem questions in the exam. Make sure you show the examiner that you understand the legal issues at hand, and you understand the different uh, interpretations that the court may take, you understand the relevant statute, relevant case law, and you are able to provide the analysis applying the relevant laws. Finally, uh, the very important topic, patent. Um, patents are registrable rights are one is able to gain over the creation of an invention. All the requirements of the Patent Act 1977 section one shall be met for the product to be able to get patent protection. So as you can as see, all three topics had one thing in common. There are specific criteria under UK law that you, they have to meet in order to attract protection under those headings. For copyright, it has to be this, this, and this. For trademark, it has to some of those qualify under the uh, definition of a trademark, under the Act. The patent, the same thing, Patent Act 1977, Section 1, all the requirements has to be met. 
So what about the requirements under the Patent Act? Invention shall be new. So it cannot be an invention that has uh, been invented before. Um, patent novelty, person skilled in the art test. This is a, um, a test under English law uh, that somebody who is skilled in that the art where the invention has been made has to say that this invention is novel. Uh, inventive steps, uh, inventive step is under section three. An invention involves an inventive step if it's not obvious to a person skilled in the art having regard to any matter which forms part of the state. And section four, industrial application. Invention is capable of industrial application if it can be made or used in any kind of industry, including agriculture. So basically, and probably you are aware of reasonable, reasonable man test uh, in criminal law. So this is a uh, similar use here. We, have, we use persons skilled in the art in intellectual property law instead of reasonable man test like we do in criminal law. So every, because intellectual property law requires more uh, skill in order somebody in, for somebody to judge whether or not uh, this uh, is a patent. So that's why instead of reasonable man, we say it has to be someone who is skilled in this specific art who has to judge whether or not this invention is uh, a novelty and if it's if it, if it would be. Up, um, applicable industrially and um, if the invention is new. To sum up, you need to analyze all your exam requirements uh, very carefully. How many questions are you required to answer? Is it going to be a coursework? Is it going to be an exam? How, if it's an exam, how much time will you have to answer the, the questions? And then um, according to the information, for example, if you have one hour to answer each, each question, make sure that when you practice, you time yourself. Uh, or if you have one hour, just time yourself that you can fit in that one hour. Mm. At least before the exam, you can give yourself such kind of tasks. Uh, do selective study. Make sure that you have a look at our model answers as well as your past exam papers to know exactly what kind of questions and what kind of topics are going to come up on your exam and focus on them rather than just every single case and every single topic you have covered on your course. There are some, there may be some small topics you have covered that will most likely not come up on the exam. So make sure that you know the big topics that will definitely come up on the exam because they always come up. So make sure that you, you focus on what's important. If you if you're struggling with understanding what is more important to focus on, how to do your study plan, you should book a teaching session with us and we'll help you um, review your, your course and give you a, a good study plan to maximize your chances of getting the highest grades. Thirdly, you need to practice, practice, practice. Uh, knowing the law is just 50% of the work and you need to practice, improve your legal writing skills and know how to apply your knowledge, your legal knowledge to the facts of the case in a problem question, how to answer essay questions and how to make good arguments to convince the examiner that you um, actually understand the law and you deserve a high grade. How to do all that requires a lot of practice. And that's why you need to answer our model questions that we have on our website, as well as your past exam papers. You are also highly recommend to get your tutoring sessions with us to practice on your legal writing skills. Uh, show us your practice answers and we'll advise you on um, where to work on and how to make sure that when you get to the, your exam, you do your best and you get the grades you deserve. Fourthly, make sure you follow your professor's guidelines. So what it means is that uh, the grading is at the end of the day subjective. So one professor may grade you a different way, the other may grade you a different way, but Actually, there is a universal set of criteria that all the professors apply, but um, you need to have a look at what your professor wants from you. How you do that? Uh, very carefully, you need to review your lecture slides. In the lecture slides, very often the professor 
that focuses on specific cases or specific principles, gives you some advice about how to answer proper question on this topic. So make sure that you know everything that your professor has said or the guidelines that your professor has given and, and follow them. Because if you don't, the professor will most likely deduct marks from you. Make sure you know all the, all the guidelines from the professor. Also, very good practice would be if you do some practice answers to past exam papers and send it to the professor to get some feedback. Some universities also do formative coursework where you can, this is not, uh, doesn't count to the grade, but you can just um, get some feedback from the professor. It's highly recommended you do that. More feedback you have from the professor, more instructions you have as to what you're required to do on the exam, um, it will be better for you to get a higher grade. But obviously the professors are usually very busy. They will most probably not answer you in detail. And that's why uh, that's where our tutoring sessions come and uh, you're highly recommended to book tutoring sessions with us in order to get further guidance as to what you're required to do to get a high grade. Now briefly, how we can help uh, for you to get maximize your chances of getting high grades. Simple study resources. The key is to have the right resources in front of you. A lot of students read many, many books and um, read thousands of pages and dozens of complicated books that may be very, very confusing. And then they get low grades. What we do is we um, we have 10% of the of the highest performing law students and graduates who create content that focuses specifically on getting high grades. Um, and we put advices of how the, that um, is tailored to help students get a first class in the simplest way possible. Uh, and then we obviously um, put everything on our website and uh, you can subscribe to our website and have access to all these materials. This is uh, this materials include simple notes, simple uh, model answers, tutorial videos, quizzes, flashcards, free classes like this, study and exam tips, an interactive learning platform. We have study groups that you can you can join for free, um, and um, uh, also this uh, the the revision classes that you can join for free. If the resources are not enough. Um, it's highly recommended that you get tutoring sessions with us. How does tutoring sessions help? Students learn correctly to get high grades. We help students to create a, a correct, good study plan, um, improve their legal writing skills, get some guidelines on how to answer their exams and courseworks and so on. We have already helped thousands of law students get high grades. We have over 6,000 subscribers and 50,000 monthly active users. Um, and you can see there is, you can see 90% of our regular users get um, a first class as you can see on the review. Uh, and uh, the, the key to getting a first class is to study regularly. So we highly recommend you to use our materials regularly, attend our classes and get tutoring sessions at least occasionally in order to maximize your chances of getting your first class. We would love you to be our next student to get high grades. Please join Simple Studying now and join our free study groups now.